This is really quite remarkable. Uh, welcome to all of you, everybody who has come out tonight. Um, I have to tell you, I, I was thinking ahead of time who might be in the room. I was trying to imagine who might come tonight. And for, this is a scenario that never occurred to me. Um, but I, I'll tell you what did occur to me. Um, I think it's very likely that some of you have fam friends or family who are in danger or who have died in this conflict already. And we offer you our deepest condolences. I want to make sure we leave space in this room for your pain. There are others here who care profoundly about what happens in Israel and Gaza and who have likely been awash in emotion over the past 11 days. I imagine there are people like me without expertise or connections to this region, but who have been reading the news daily with a sense of horror and sadness and who are here to learn more about how we got to this place and what the future could hold. I'm also pretty sure that there are students in the room with very little knowledge about Israel or Gaza, or even what's been happening lately, and I'm glad that you're here too also to learn. For this last group, let me give an extremely brief orientation to what we're here to discuss. We have uh, two areas that are Palestinian territories in, in Israel, and uh, the southern one is the Gaza Strip. It's a small piece of land. Um, that, is, uh, that has a highly fortified security zone and the boundary between the Gaza Strip and, and Israel with extremely limited movement of people and goods between them for the past 15 years. On October 7th, 11 days ago, the organization Hamas la launched a surprise military attack across that barrier into Israeli territory. By some accounts, they killed at least 1,400 people, many of them civilians, including children. In reprisal, the Israeli army has killed thousands of residents in Gaza in airstrikes. More than a million residents of Gaza have been displaced from their homes. There is so much more to say, but it is not my job to say it. Um, we're thrilled to have four speakers here that have very different areas of expertise, and they're each going to be speaking from um, different perspectives and different um, uh, pos positions as, in, as human beings, but also academically with different areas of expertise. Uh, with you today. Each of our panelists will speak for about 12 minutes. Um, do keep track of your questions and your comments, and we'll open up for general dialogue a little after 7.30, probably, is, 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 my, is my best guess. The one, one other note, um, this is kind of an odd place for a classroom, is it not, in Peterson Gym? And so many of you may not have been here before, and I'll tell you that the restroom scenario is kind of odd. But I'll tell you that if you need a restroom, you'd go out the left-hand door and turn to, like your right-hand door, sorry, right-hand door and turn to your left and you'll, and you'll find it. Um, if you are standing and you would like some place more comfortable to sit, there are some spots here or even in front of, of um, some of the, um, the seating area where you could actually sit with your back against something that might be more comfortable than standing the entire time. All right, so that is uh, kind of the nuts and bolts of what we're doing here. All set? Um, I will then turn to introduce um, our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Suzanne Hillman. Dr. Hillman earned her PhD in modern German Jewish history from UC San Diego. She's a full-time lecturer in SDSU's history department. She regularly teaches courses on modern Jewish history, the Jewish heritage, and the history of the Holocaust. Thank you so much, Dr. Hillman, for joining us. I'll help you situate here. Is that a good? Does that sound good? Here, try it again. Okay, yeah, I think that sounds better. That's good. Okay, thank you first of all for having me. Uh, thank you also to my students who are here. I see you all over the place, which is wonderful. So my topic is Zionism then and now. As a historian specializing in modern German Jewish history, I inevitably approach current events in Israel-Palestine through a historical lens, specifically through the lens of Jewish history. This does not mean, however, that I am oblivious to the suffering and hardship endured by other people, including Palestinian civilians trapped and bombarded in Gaza right now. This at the outset. Few words have proven as explosive in connection with the Israel-Palestine conflict as Zionism. For decades, the word has been used to attack Israel's right to exist, not least by the updated charter of Hamas. 
Although the charter distinguishes between Jews, whom it claims not to oppose, and Zionists, its about enemies, for many, if not most Jews, this distinction is largely meaningless. According to Article 14 of the new Hamas charter, and I quote, the Zionist project is a racist, aggressive, colonial, and expansionist project based on seizing the properties of others. It is hostile to the Palestinian people and to their aspiration for freedom, liberation, return, and self-determination. The Israeli entity is the plaything of the Zionist project and its base of aggression, end quote. Needless to say, this is a description that few Zionist pioneers would have recognized. Historians focus on context and change. Simply put, they historicize events. The Zionism of today, I aim to show, is not the same as the original Zionism of the pioneers. In what follows, I will discuss a few key points about the movement's origin, touch on historical watersheds, and conclude with reflections on the recent events in Gaza and Israel in connection with Zionism. To begin with a definition, Zionism is both an ideology and a movement. As a shorthand, it refers to Jewish nationalism. It was Zionism's misfortune that it appeared relatively late on the historical scene. By the late 19th century, um, a significant number of nations had acquired a state, although large empires continued to exist. Unlike other nationalisms, Zionism was driven not only by the desire for national self-determination, but also, and even more so, I would argue, by the urgent need to confront the persecution Jews routinely endured in both Western and Eastern Europe. In the Russian Empire, for example, Jews suffered repeated pogroms in the early 20th century. The Odessa pogrom of 1905, to give just one example, resulted in the murder of at least 400 Jews. At the conclusion of World War I, over 100,000 Jews living in the area of today's Ukraine were brutally slaughtered, sometimes by their neighbors. Clearly, the major push factor behind the Zionist movement was the need to ensure communal survival. A second crucial point about Zionism is its diversity. Scholars have long pointed out that it would actually be more correct to speak of Zionisms in the plural. Besides political Zionism, the branch that sought to obtain a charter sanctioning Jewish settlement in Ottoman Palestine, there was a labor, revisionist, religious, and cultural version of Zionism. Cultural Zionists did not envision the establishment of a Jewish state, but merely a cultural center in Palestine. A third important point concerns religion. Prominent Zionists like Theodor Herzl, Max Nordau, or Arthur Rupin were staunchly secular. They imagined the new, a new Jew in a new land, a hardy pioneer working uh, the soil, a so-called muscle Jew. There was, however, a messianic slash redemptive impulse behind early Zionism that would come to fruition after 1967. Secular settlers, many of them leftists, believed that Palestine ought to be theirs by virtue of the labor they undertook to redeem the land. It was not considered holy as such, though the terminology seems to suggest uh, otherwise. Up until the 1930s, Zionism was a fairly marginal movement among world Jewry, despite the fact that Jewish settlement efforts had received a decisive boost with the, rise, uh, with the so-called Balfour Declaration of 1917. What changed the situation, the marginality of Zionism, was the rise to power of Adolf Hitler and his comprehensive and ultimately genocidal onslaught on Europe's Jews. Very few countries were willing to admit Jewish refugees um, to their uh, well, to admit Jewish refugees. Up until 1939, Palestine was an exception to this trend, but under Arab pressure, the British mandatory government implemented strict limits on refugees. The Holocaust would claim the lives of two-thirds of European Jewry, or roughly six million. It is hard to overstate the traumatic impact of this catastrophe. At war's end, survivors who returned to their hometowns were often met with renewed, sometimes deadly violence. Meanwhile, the United States did not open its doors to displaced persons languishing in DP camps. In the absence of other options, British-administered Palestine seemed to be the last resort for Jews who had belatedly come to accept Zionism as the logical response to the Shoah, uh, the Holocaust. By the fall of 1947, the recently established United Nations held a vote on the partition of Palestine. Convinced that the ongoing conflict between Jews and Arabs admitted of no resolution, 72% of all UN members voted in favor of partition. This was, of course, before decolonization. While the Zionist leadership grudgingly accepted the plan, its Palestinian counterpart rejected it. 
When Israel declared its independence about eight months later, the combined armies of five surrounding states, Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq, went to war against the new country. The war ended with Israel's surprising victory and the flight and expulsion of roughly 700,000 Palestinians, the event Palestinians refer to as the Nakba, or catastrophe. From the perspective of political Zionism, the movement's main goal had now been achieved. Jews had gained an independent, internationally recognized state. Over the following years, uh, large numbers of immigrants would settle in Israel, including roughly 800,000 North African and Middle Eastern Jews fleeing dispossession and sometimes violence. And in this way, uh, some Jewish communities that had existed literally for thousands of years came to a sudden end. Not all or even most of these new arrivals were bona fide Zionists. The Six Day War of 1967 would breathe new life into Zionism. Israel launched this war preemptively in response to Egyptian provocation. From the Israeli perspective, the war was a stunning triumph. Israel now occupied the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. The war also sparked a Zionist revival, this time of a religious kind. The original religious Zionists had been Orthodox moderates who yearned for a revitalized homeland. The new religious Zionists were of a different caliber. They were settlers who dreamed of a greater Israel, including the entire West Bank, an area they refer to by the biblical terms Judea and Samaria. Gush Emunim, Block of the Faithful, which was founded in 1974, led settlement efforts which were and are generously supported by the Israeli government. In the early 1990s, the peace process which resulted in the Oslo Accords gave hope for settler withdrawal and a lasting solution to the conflict. Tragically, it was derailed when a Jewish extremist assassinated the Israeli um, Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Israel's unilateral withdrawal from Gaza in 2005 further radicalized religious settlers already prone to radicalism. The so-called disengagement not only failed to appease the Palestinian leadership, but also infuriated the roughly 8,500 settlers who had to leave the Gaza Strip, as well as people supportive of redemptive settlement. As a result, uh, new versions of religious Zionism have, Zionism have emerged. The so-called Hardalim, Hardal being an acronym for National Religious Haredim, that is ultra-Orthodox, seek the replacement of a democratic government with a full-blown theocracy. In their quest to achieve a greater Israel, they are willing to use the state as an instrument for the implementation of their plan. Even more extreme are the so-called hilltop youth, who seek to overthrow the Israeli government and to establish what they see as a Torah state. Over the years, they have built illegal outposts from where they periodically engage in violent attacks on Palestinians, such as the recent uh, pogrom in Huwara um, in February, I believe, this year. In the view of the hilltop youth, violence and revenge are divinely sanctioned. There are currently around 20,000 of these um, extremists. What does all this have to do with the current crisis between Israel and Hamas? At its most basic, Hamas' brutal murder of more than 1,000 Israeli civilians was a direct response to the Zionist enterprise. At least this is what apologists would like to assert. This view ignores that the majority of Israelis are not rabid Zionists of the hilltop kind. Zionists aimed to achieve national self-determination for the Jewish people, and they succeeded in doing so. As stated in its charter, Hamas rejects Israel's legitimacy and does not recognize the right of the Zionist entity to exist. For Hamas and its apologists, Zionism was and is the arch enemy. As suggested earlier, the Six Day War and the emergence of a very different kind of religious Zionism has spelled disaster for the Palestinians. Most recently, extremist settlers who embrace violence and who are egged on by far-right Israeli statesmen have demonstrated their utter unwillingness to consider a peaceful solution to the conflict. To understand what has happened in and near Gaza, it is also necessary to understand what has been going on in the occupied territories. In the short time allotted to me, it has been my aim to throw light on Zionism past and present. I have tried neither to whitewash Zionism nor to demonize it. Like most historical phenomena, Zionism is complex and far from monolithic. Already in the 1960s, uh, Israel's founding father, David Ben-Gurion, remarked, and I quote, the tide of Zionism now embraces entirely different things among which there is no connection, and to speak of Zionism per se has no real meaning. 
Simply put, Israel is the result of Zionism. It serves little purpose in my mind, and this is historically inaccurate to dismiss the movement as nothing but brutal oppression, although it has been that for many Palestinians. To Zionists and Jews, settlement in Palestine offered a new way of being Jewish after centuries of discrimination and relegation to the margins of European society. As such, it was a movement of liberation. To many more Jews without the home, it offered a life-saving sanctuary in, well, in the aftermath of genocide. Automatically rejecting Zionism as something inherently evil shuts down dialogue before it starts. To those who may think that dialogue is the last thing we need in today's tense situation, I would respond, dialogue, speaking, but also listening, is exactly what we need in the current moment, lest uh, we let the bombs and rockets do all the talking. Last week, I overheard someone on campus declare that the only thing Israel can do now is kill, kill, kill. It was unclear whether the speaker referred to Hamas only. At the very least, this point was not clarified. I was chilled by the statement made calmly by an educated person. If there is to be any hope for peace, we should remember that Zionism has not always been and need not be of the kind embodied by the Hilltop Youth, nor the racist project excoriated by Hamas. Nor is it morally defensible to reduce Palestinians to terrorists and animals to be shot down or removed in other ways. At the end of the day, I wholeheartedly believe that only a proper understanding of Zionism's history, as well as the history of Palestinian resistance to it, promises hope, if only a fool's hope, for a better future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Farid Abdel Noor, who is the chair of the political science department here at SDSU. Farid Abdel Noor earned his PhD in political science at Rutgers University. He is professor of political science at SDSU. He's been a member of the faculty since 2000. His teaching and research are in the areas of political theory and Middle East politics. He is also one of the founding members of SDSU's Center for Islamic and Arabic Studies. Please join me in welcoming Farid Abdel Noor. What is the value of Palestinian life? This is the question I invite you to join me in thinking about today. Since October 7th this year, when an offensive by the Al-Qassam brigades, the military wing of Hamas, led to the killing of about 1,400 Israelis, more than 3,000 Palestinians have been killed. And this is without counting the 500 killed at the Al-Ahli Ma'madani Hospital yesterday. So since October 7th, more than two Palestinians have been killed for every Israeli who has been killed. This lopsided ratio has had no effect on the US administration. It still thinks that it's not time to call for a ceasefire. In fact, just today, the United States vetoed a UN Security Council resolution calling for a humanitarian pause in the fighting. I think it would be fair to wonder precisely how many Palestinians would have to be killed before the US administration decides that it is enough and that calls for a ceasefire. Looking at the past can give us a hint of what that number might be that would make the US government uncomfortable and would move it to try to end the fighting. Let's look at how things were before October 7th. For many of you, I assume, before that day, this conflict was not front and center on your minds. Perhaps you knew things were not great, but thought that there is enough calm to make the situation acceptable enough, bearable enough, normal enough, that you do not need to be thinking about it. You probably got your sense that things were good enough or tolerable enough from the US administration's messaging, because before October 7th, the Palestinian people barely featured in this and the previous administration's, administration's strategy for the Middle East. So what is this situation that one could treat as bearable enough, normal enough, so that one did not need to interrupt one's life to go to a protest or attend a teach-in? Let's take a few minutes to consider the cruel and macabre world of kill ratios. During the last 15 years, prior to October 7th, 
more than 6,400 Palestinians were killed by Israelis, and 308 Israelis were killed by Palestinians. This means that on average, in the last 15 years, 20 Palestinians were killed by Israelis for every Israeli who was killed by Palestinians. So what was the value of Palestinian life before October 7th? We live in a world in which the US government considered it acceptable and normal that the life of a Palestinian on average is worth 5% of the life of an Israeli. It is under these conditions that things in Israel-Palestine seemed to them to be tolerable, acceptable, imperfect, but good enough. My worry is that the US administration might be waiting for the kill ratio it has been comfortable with for so long to reestablish itself. And for that to happen after October 7th, 28,000 Palestinians would need to die, which would be another 25,000 to go. I do not say this only to shock you, although yes, I do intend to shock you, but also to help you understand something very central to the Palestinian experience that this stark and macabre possibility illustrates. Being treated as inferior and unworthy of equal consideration lies at the core of the Palestinian experience for the last 100 years or so. This is the core of the Palestinian grievance. You will not understand how Palestinians feel, why they think what they think, what motivates them and moves them until you internalize this fact about them. They carry the burden of being treated as subordinate, dismissible, and as obstacles to others' dreams. Let me telegraphically sketch for you an account of the Palestinian experience that might help you understand why that is the case. Before the arrival of the Zionist movement to Palestine in the late 19th century, Palestine was a thriving multi-religious society with many cities and towns and hundreds of villages with a very large Muslim majority, a significant Christian minority, and a smaller but also significant Jewish minority. All were Arabic speaking and culturally Arab. It is in this context where 95% of the population of Palestine was either Muslim or Christian, that the Zionist movement began to pursue its goal of establishing a Jewish state in Palestine. How does one do that? How does one establish a Jewish state in a land overwhelmingly populated by people who do not ident identify as Jewish? A part of that answer is, of course, increased Jewish immigration. But that turned out to be nowhere near enough. Muslim and Christian Palestinians were from the beginning seen and treated as an obstacle to this project. Somehow, they had to be removed or neutralized. Colonial Britain which was instrumental in helping realize this project, helped by downgrading the status of Palestinians. Already in 1917, when in the Balfour Declaration that Britain arrogantly and without any moral or legal basis decided to promise the land of Palestine to the Zionist movement, it deprived the Palestinian people of political rights, referring to them as having only civil and religious rights, meaning that they were to have no say in how the country in which they formed the overwhelming majority of the population was to be governed. What followed were policies upon policies that treated Palestinians as a disposable problem that will somehow resolve itself. By 1937, it became clear to anyone who was paying any attention that there was no way of establishing a Jewish state in Palestine, no matter how you carved up the country, that did not entail doing very severe harm to the Palestinian people. When things came to a head in 1947-1948 and the State of Israel was established on 78% of the land of historic Palestine, 80% of the Palestinians who lived on that portion of the land were either expelled at gunpoint or fled in fear of their lives. My parents were among those Palestinian refugees who were displaced, dispossessed, and dispersed. Some Palestinians went to Lebanon, others went to Jordan, and yet others went to the 22% of Palestine that had not been turned into the state of Israel. Many from the coastal region and the southern parts of the country were expelled or fled to Gaza. Every native Gazan in 1948 had to absorb more than two refugees. This is how it came about that Gaza is so crowded and how it is that more than two thirds of its population today are refugees who were pushed out of the towns and villages surrounding it and from the regions to the north and east. 
The Palestinians who became refugees assumed that they will go home when the hostilities ended. But Israel immediately barred them from returning to their homes, making them into permanent refugees. And to cement this further, it dynamited and bulldozed hundreds of their villages, so that even if any succeeded in returning, they would not find home. It then proceeded to cover up the, cover up the evidence in, every, in many instances by planting pine forests on the sites of Palestinian villages. What I have been summarizing for you is the Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe, the destruction of Palestinian society, which is the price that the Palestinian people were made to pay for the establishment of the State of Israel. Those Palestinians who remained in the area that became Israel were placed under military rule for 19 years. And even though they were given Israeli citizenship, they remain until today second class citizens. Their treatment is the beginning of a process that came to have wider and deeper reach. In 1967, when Israel occupied the remaining 22% of Palestine, which is the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, it came to control the lives of large numbers of Palestinians, many of them refugees from 1948, who this time stayed put on the land. Israel then proceeded to slowly and steadily build an elaborate system of ethno-religious subordination that it imposed on Palestinians. A physical and legal and institutional infrastructure was built that makes it such that even if Palestinians are present on the land, their existence will not interfere with the Jewish dominance in the state. Primarily, primarily for those Palestinians who Israel occupied after 1967, this meant being deprived of citizenship, severe restrictions on their movement, and on where they can live. Palestinian towns and villages were combined into clusters that Israel could surround and block off from the outside world anytime it sees fit, separating them from Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which is the cultural and religious center of Palestinian life, and from one another, and making movement between different Palestinian towns and villages difficult. A separate legal system was put in place that does not apply to Jews who might live in settlements next door. What emerged over decades and is now in full bloom is a system that fulfills the definition of apartheid under international law. And if you have not read the Human Rights Watch report called A Threshold Crossed from 2021, I recommend it to you, at least read the executive summary. Gaza got extra special treatment. It was placed under siege after Israel withdrew its military and settlers from it in 2005. Israel continued to be the occupying power by controlling who and what may enter Gaza Israel controls the sea and the land crossings, including the one with Egypt that it, it, it controls together with Egypt, and the airspace. For 16 years, Israel has been rationing and calibrating how much food, fuel, electricity may enter as it sees fit. Gaza's groundwater has long stopped being potable. The level of salinity in it is not fit for human consumption. It does not even allow soap to form a lather. This means that without electricity and fuel, there is no desalination and no potable water. This subordination and suffocation has been made into the prerequisite for allowing Palestinians to live in Palestine. Palestinians have to endure a great deal of suffering to continue to live in their country. The system of subordination they are compelled to live under is applied in its mildest form to those among them who are citizens of Israel, a harsher version is applied in East Jerusalem, and an even harsher one is operative in the West Bank. But those who live in Gaza endure and have for many years endured the harshest and most cruel form of this system. The two main injustices to which Palestinians have been subjected for the last 74 years, 75 years are forced displacement and subordination, and these two are related. The conditions of subordination can be made so onerous as to yield displacement. We see this today in Gaza. The threat of an ethnic cleansing of Gaza is no longer hypothetical. It has begun to be implemented. And even without the ongoing cruel bombardment, the mere tightening of the siege to stop all shipments of food and fuel and block electricity can be used as a tool of ethnic cleansing. Echoes of the trauma, trauma of the Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe of 1948, are impossible to miss. So going back to what I started out with, what is the value of Palestinian life? To ask this question also requires asking another question. Under what conditions is a life worth living? A human life 
is not just the persistence of a biological organism that breathes. A breathing human being expects and deserves dignity, equal moral consideration and respect. Let us say you manage to escape slaughter. Let us say someone finally decides that you should be allowed to have what it takes for you to continue breathing, and you remain alive as a biological organism. Is that enough? If you continue to be abused, deprived of your rights, imprisoned collectively, subordinated and humiliated, your life will be difficult to bear. And the question arises whether it is even worth continuing to breathe. So far, I've been offering you a brief account of the Palestinian experience as I see it. What I have described has been the case for many years as one and was ongoing before the fateful day of October 7th. Yet before that day, these, consider, these conditions were considered tolerable enough by successive US administrations, regardless of party, as to not warrant any action or attention. So how do we think ahead? It is simple. Keep one principle in mind and never compromise on it. A Palestinian life is not 5%. And you can't allow yourself to think of it as a fraction of any sort. A Palestinian life has equal worth equal dignity, deserves equal concern, consideration, and respect. Palestinians' hopes for a better future deserve equal, not less concern, than Israelis' hopes for a better future. There are many possible paths forward. But before we talk about them, we must first begin with, correction, with a correction of the severe moral distortion that reigns in this country's mainstream political discourse. We must not only insist on an immediate ceasefire, we must also refuse to allow anyone to get away with treating as normal or acceptable the unbearably oppressive conditions that Palestinians were compelled to endure even before October 7th. Keep your eyes on a simple principle. Palestinian life must be treated as having the exact same value as an Israeli life. Anything less is a recipe for perpetual conflict and misery for generations to come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is, is Dr. Ted Falk. He's a professor of history at USD where he's taught since 2019. He teaches courses on the modern Middle East, political Islam, and Jewish history. He received his PhD from UCSD in 2018 after archival research in Turkey, Lebanon, and France. His work focuses on non-Muslim education and identity in the Ottoman Empire. He translates Arabic, Turkish, and French, and he's currently learning Yiddish with his seven-month-old son. Welcome. This is a thing. going to be a somewhat more informal uh, discussion than our previous speakers, because uh, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the, the Oslo generation of, of people about my age or, or younger, your age, who grew up during the era of the, the quote-unquote two-state solution, where it seemed that a, a Palestinian state was just one more agreement from coming into existence. Um, but first, I wanted to talk about the, the tendency uh, in politics to, again, to lose that, that view of human dignity. Um, so uh, President Biden, when he was asked about the Al-Akhli hospital bombing, uh, he said that he pointed to Israeli intelligence that said the other team was responsible. And I think that is a very ugly turn of phrase, the, the, the tendency to view war and peace as a sport, that, that you can track uh, casualties like you're tracking a, um, the score. And I think um, there were you know, many Palestinians who, who felt something like that on October 7th, that this had been the deadliest year for Palestinian civilians, I believe, since 2002. And so what Hamas was doing was evening the score. And I think a lot of Israelis are seeing it through that lens as well, that in, in the Israeli military operations since then, they are evening the score. Um, that kind of evokes a collective responsibility and collective punishment. 
uh, the idea that every uh, that there are no innocents, that every person in Gaza or every Palestinian is responsible for Hamas's actions, and every Israeli is responsible for the, go the government of Israel's actions. Uh, this leads to a lot of, in, in the United States, a lot of scared Jews and Muslims who believe that they will be targeted because of the actions of this group or that group. Um, this, is, this dehumanization, I think, has, has come out in what the Israeli Minister of Defense, Yoav Gallant, said, we are fighting human animals and we are acting accordingly. Uh, Governor Ron DeSantis uh, of Florida said, if you look at how they behave, speaking of Gazans, not all of them are Hamas, but they all are anti-Semitic uh, in, in saying we should reject Palestinian refugees. Um, and I, I think it's worth noting, and he pointed to the fact that Hamas won the Palestinian legislative election of 2006. Um, but about two thirds of uh, residents of Gaza are under 25 years old, which means they didn't get to choose any sort of government in 2006. Uh, coincidentally, the first time I got the right to vote was 2006. And I was in Syria in 2007 during the Iraqi insurgency. And at one point, there was an American bombing of insurgents fleeing from Iraq to Syria. And there were, there were protests. Uh, they shut down Western Union, so I couldn't pay my rent. And I was worried that you know, my, my Syrian friends would be angry with me, uh, that, that you know, my government was bombing their country. Uh, and I'll never forget what, what uh, my friend Hussein, who's now a uh, refugee from the Syrian civil war, um, said is, uh, Habibi, I didn't know you could call in airstrikes, uh, referring to me as a 22-year-old. Uh, you know, so going back to the 90s, um, I think it, it, it's hard to overestimate the, the, the figure of the, the, the dual figures of, of Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat, both in the, uh, the liberal or, or uh, leftist Israeli camp and in the, the movement of Palestinian resistance. Um, because when they, Israel looked for another partner to negotiate with, whether that was Jordan or Egypt or, or whomever, and it took a lot of credibility. I mean, he was a, a war hero. Uh, in the 1948, 67, and 73 wars. Um, he was a, a great villain for the Palestinian people because of his role as the Minister of Defense during the first Intifada uh, from 1987 to 91 or so. And so the fact that this, this great Israeli villain and this great uh, Palestinian villain, uh, you know, shook hands on, on the White House lawn under President Clinton's uh, oversight, that cost them both greatly. Uh, it cost uh, Yitzhak Rabin his life. And by accepting this, this, this deal, the, the, the Oslo process, uh, it was not quite a state. Um, and that le led to you know, Rabin's assassination by uh, a, 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 a settler who, who believed that he was following God's commandments, that, that the settlers are, are bound by God, not by any, any government of Israel. And Arafat faced attacks from the left by, by people like Edward Said and Marwan Borghuti for accepting a bad deal for this statelet. Um, and the experiment of administrative autonomy. This was supposed to lead to more areas becoming, coming under Palestinian control in 1999, but as we know, that, um, that did not happen. And, and Benjamin Netanyahu really rode that wave of anger with Rabin for meeting with Arafat and, and agreeing to the Oslo Accords. Uh, he rode that wave for his first term in office um, and has rode that wave ever since. Um, what Rabin said, uh, speaking of the, the, the Gush uh, Emunim uh, that, that uh, my colleague was, was referring to earlier, what he said in the, the 70s was, from a historic perspective, people will think Israel's primary concern in 1976 is some shitty meaningless places, a mystical issue that Israel's existence supposedly depended on. 
And then he said, I don't think it's possible to exist in the long run if we don't want a state of apartheid, that's his word, with a million and a half Arabs in a Jewish state whose birth rate will always be higher because of their poverty. Um, it was a million and a half in 1976, and now it is five million Palestinians in the occupied territories and another two million in Israel. But both Rabin and later Ariel Sharon, the prime minister in the early 2000s, they, they premised their, their plan for peace, uh, or whether it included a Palestinian state, was to reduce contact between Israeli Jews and Palestinians. And the, the settlement movement that's roughly doubled since the 90s uh, is kind of flying in the face of that. that, that in the 90s, there were, I think, 200,000 uh, Israeli settlers in, in the West Bank. Now that number is something like 600,000. So there's more and more contact. So I want to say one thing about Hamas in particular. That is, you know, if, if we view the, the siege of, uh, of Gaza through the lens of our prison system, Hamas is empowered by the walls, that whether in Israel or whether in the United States, if you go to prison, you usually join a prison gang to survive. And they are empowered by those prison conditions. Uh, also notably, 40% uh, of male Palestinians spend time in an Israeli prison at some point in their lives. And th these are places of radicalization. Uh, these are young men, whether they were locked up for a good reason or a bad reason, with a grudge. Um, and I think that that in combination with hopelessness um, is, is what is their strength. Um, for, I, their, their strength meaning Hamas. Um, and it's, it's the, the occupation that will continue to empower them. Um, in conversations with a, a Palestinian colleague, uh, the, a point he made to me is that it's not that we, it's not, he's saying he, he's a, a Christian, he doesn't support Hamas, doesn't want to live under their rule, um, but he said, every few years, Hamas makes Israelis feel the same fear that we do. That, that it, it is that sense of, of fear and hopelessness that empowers uh, their ideology. So I think we ha what we have to face that, that I think some you know, liberal Zionists like Peter Beinart and others have, have mentioned it is, is there a two-state solution on the horizon or are we stuck with this one-state reality? And if we have a one-state solution, are we uh, going to countenance uh, different sets of laws for different people? I will finish with some kind of final takeaways that I believe that no Israeli government will or can dismantle the settlements. I think this is the lesson of Ariel Sharon's 2005 disengagement plan. Um, he was the, the leader of Likud, um, and hit, Netanyahu withdrew from his cabinet because of the disengagement. And that was only a few thousand Israeli settlements, uh, a few thousand Israeli settlers, rather, in Gaza. But the, the images of Israeli police forcibly removing Israeli settlers from Gaza um, were kind of put onto the historical record and, and cost him much of his support, so he had to found a whole new political party, um, even not exactly wanting a Palestinian state. I think another thing we have to recognize is that Israeli Jews won't accept becoming a minority, um, which is you know, part of the premise of a one-state solution, of, of one person, one vote. Another thing is that Hamas isn't going away. Um, they can be militarily destroyed, but that spirit of resistance um, will always return. Um, I think there is something that, that kind of rhymes about Palestinians and Jews in that the world wants you to go away, and so that, that refusal to go away is, is part of uh, Jewish and Palestinian identity. I think we also have to recognize you know, what uh, Rabin talked about in, in the 70s, 
that if, if, if one group of people has a higher birth rate than the other group of people, um, what will happen to that? And I, I think that has also affected Israeli Jews as well, in that religious Zionists um, have a much higher birth rate than secular Zionists. Uh, they, you know, they are following God's commandments and God didn't tell them to uh, use birth control. Uh, so, the demo so Israeli demographics are changing as well as Palestinian demographics. And I think that is changing Israeli politics. Uh, I don't think Yitzhak Rabin, for all his you know, war heroics, could get elected today. I don't think the leader of the, the founder of revisionist Zionism, Vladimir Jabotinsky, uh, could, he, I think he would be too far left for the Israeli political spectrum uh, today. Um, I'll close by, by reading from a, a Soviet journalist remarking on the Soviet occupation of Afghanistan. And I think it, it, it speaks to the Israeli occupation and how that is shaping Israel uh, and as well as Palestinians. So what Artyom Borovic said is, we thought we were civilizing a backwards country by exposing it to television, to modern bombs, to schools, to the latest models of tanks, to books, to long-range artillery, to newspapers, to economic aid, to AK-47s. But we rarely stopped to think how Afghanistan would, would influence us. In Afghanistan, we bombed not only the detachments of rebels and their caravans, but our own ideals as well. With the war came the reevaluation of our moral and ethical values. In Afghanistan, the policies of the government became utterly incompatible with the inherent morality of our nation. And so I, I, I think the occupation is not only a, a curse on uh, the Palestinian people living under it, but a curse on the Israeli body politic and, and the nation of Israel. Uh, so I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Our last speaker is, is Dr. Jonathan Grobart, who is a professor of political science here at San Diego State University. He specializes in the areas of international relations, international law, Zionism, and Jewish descent, Israel-Palestine, the United Nations, normative theory, and resistance politics. He received his PhD in political science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and his JD from UC Berkeley Law School. Um, Dr. Grobart's recent book is Jewish Self-Determination Beyond Zionism, Lessons from Hannah Arendt and Other Pariahs. It was from Temple University Press last year, or actually this year, 2023. Um, so well, join me in welcoming uh, Jonathan Grobart. Thanks, sorry I gave too many things that I specialize in. I got carried away. <laughs> All right, uh, so mine's gonna start off very personal. I wake up Saturday morning, October 7th, and I read about these horrifying actions of Hamas. Systematic murders of whole families, people attending a concert, just have this feeling of utter shock and revulsion. I remembered many years ago, I think back before Ted was born, um, living in the Negev in Israel, visiting distant family in Beersheba, worried for my close Israeli friends, now worried for my close, living, close Israeli friends living here, but with family and friends in that area, including uh, kibbutzim in that area. And I was also happy that some non-Jewish friends um, contacted me to ask uh, you know, how I was and if any family and friends of mine in Israel are okay. That made me feel good, but at the same time, I'm thinking, okay, how did we get to this point? And also, how devastating will Israel's response be? Will all Palestinians be dehumanized as part of some broader evil that will make killing and ethnic cleansing easier? It's good, on one hand, that leading U.S. figures were expressing compassion for Israeli victims, but I couldn't help thinking that they rarely do this for Palestinian victims of Israel's atrocities and structural oppression? And would the US now be enabling an ensuing bloodbath of alarming proportions? 
By the next day, I saw in my email there would be a rally for Palestine at Balboa Park. A close friend of mine invited me to join him there. I couldn't do that. This wasn't the time for me to focus on Palestinians while the slaughter of Israelis had either just ended or not quite ended. And I did worry about what some of the slogans and chants might be. Would they even condemn the Hamas killings? To be sure, I shared a general concern of those attending the rally that the US needs to be much more informed of the severe injustices long inflicted upon Palestinians and to not license an Israeli bloodbath in retaliation. So uh, the old saying that the pen is mightier than the sword, I stayed home and worked on an op-ed. It took me kind of two days to think through it, so I kept reading news events and seeing a surge uh, in blanket dismissals of Palestinians and racist comments and calls for revenge. So the op-ed came out in Common Dreams last Wednesday, entitled, quote, Reflections on the Hamas Offensive and U.S. Complicity, the Danger of One-Sided Condemnations, and I circulated it widely to friends and acquaintances. Most responses I got you know, directly to me were supportive, but not all, including some family members who weren't wild about it. Uh, the one who was most harsh was my old PhD advisor at the University of Wisconsin. He lamented that I was too restrained in my condemnation of Hamas and that I showed little empathy for what Israelis faced. I read it Wednesday night, shaken by his tone, didn't sleep well. Next morning I woke up, I got an apology from him. He, met, he conceded he was just very emotional, he was over the top. He encouraged me to keep writing and said he too is worried about what Israel will do, including ethnic cleansing. It was the first time my old advisor has ever apologized to me. And he did used to rip my dissertation chapter, so that was a big deal. Anyways, the whole experience, including what my old advisor wrote, uh, led me to think of a great theme, of a theme of long of concern for me as a citizen, scholar, and activist moral responsibility with regard to grave injustices. And so I break it down like this. One area of moral responsibility is just as a human being. Condemn all who engage in brutal behavior and have compassion for all victims, just as human beings. Second, part of the academic in me, but even if I wasn't, ac even if I wasn't an academic, hopefully I would do this, is attention to the broader context, to structural factors, to the root conditions that enable these atrocities without justifying them, but understanding how we got there. Those who read Hannah Arendt's great book, Eichmann in Jerusalem, that's exactly what she was doing. Of course she condemned Eichmann, but she wanted to understand more broadly the context that produced people like Eichmann. And then I thought, okay, another part of moral responsibility is distinguishing between cathartic, feel-good condemnations from effective action. Often one has to think, will speaking out at a particular time help? And if so, in what manner? Just joining the chorus of attacking abuses of the enemies, you know, whatever the Soviet Union used to do in the old days, or Russia, Iran, it may actually backfire for those victims, and it may fuel a belligerency at home that will increase suffering all around. Taking it more to this conflict, I thought for the Palestine Solidarity Movement's protesting here, uh, focusing on simplistic excuses for their actions, or even calling this ugly terrorist actions resistance, it may feel purist and decolonizing, but are morally acceptable and, you know, as important, politically counterproductive. Ask how, would, how this would really help Palestinians if you're seen as glorifying heinous actions or not acknowledging and rejecting deliberate killings of innocents. And then, for those rallying for Israelis, uh, demanding these one-sided condemnations, I understand. When I was younger, I wanted to do that too, and that feels very satisfying. But what effect will it have? Will it contribute to anti-Palestinian and Islamophobia? Is it really gonna help promote a desirable comprehensive approach? Or is it just going to lead to a new bout of very deadly vengeance that creates more enemies and does nothing to address the Hamas threat? And then crucially, I believe in an added responsibility for the injustices perpetrated by one's own community. So as an American Jew, 
That would be the US primarily, hence my focus in my op-ed was on US complicity. It would be Israel, it would be the American Jewish community. Such actions, after all, are being done in my name, and they're the ones that I'm best able to influence, at least on a micro scale. So with regard to Israel-Palestine, I have for 35 years, so I'm reminded again by Ted of how old I am, uh, I've been most invested in the American Jewish peace movement. While as an academic, I've gained expert expertise in various areas that Dr. Maher already referred to. One in particular would be Jewish descent. Um, ultimately then, while I'm fundamentally rooted in the Jewish community, I regard myself as being both pro-Israel and pro-Palestine. And by this, I simply mean devoted to helping bring about a just coexistence of Israeli Jews and Palestinian Arabs. Speaking of my expertise, I have regularly taught on laws of war, including international humanitarian law, also known in Latin as jus in bello. So I want to just identify a few points I'm happy to elaborate during questioning. There are some legal com complications, even saying it, uh, between uh, Hamas and Israel, and that this is an asymmetric war between a state, Israel, it's a regional military powerhouse, and a much weaker party, Hamas, with little formal global status that governs just one part of the occupied Palestinian territories. Still, over the years, most legal scholars, leading international organizations agree the fundamental principles of international humanitarian law apply to both sides. Distinctions between civilian and military targets, minimizing casualties of non-combatants, proportionality, and others. Interesting, I don't think this is that well known, both the Israeli government and even Hamas officials, when pressed by international parties, not necessarily an internal dialogue, formally acknowledge the applicability of international humanitarian law when fighting. Israel, of course, also has legal institutions, it has an army, I mean, it has lawyers in place formally designed to ensure that, fo that uh, fi fighting does not openly violate international humanitarian law. Yet, in different ways, both parties commit severe violations. What most stands out in the present conflict are on the Hamas side, the deliberate executions and kidnappings of civilians in the first few days. In Israel, the complete blockade of Gaza, food, water, fuel, electricity, and the demand that roughly half the population, so in northern Gaza, in a heavily dense area, relocate in a very short period to the southern half. In the midst of all this, and while heavy bombing is taking place and while the, major, the leading hospital is in the northern side. This I see as an amped up trail of tears, those who know your US history, where people are dying along the forced exodus. So while Hamas's atro atrocities are indeed atrocities and they're more visceral, which is perhaps one reason why they've uh, invited much more condemnation here, Israel's ongoing actions will bring a lot more deaths, ethnic cleansing, and I want to be careful here, if unchecked, could cross over into genocide. I'm not one who uses that term loosely, I don't think Israel has done that yet, but this one looks like we're getting very close. This is no longer just um, like a slogan, this is something that looks uh, uh, possible. I do still take hope. I see many Jews and Palestinians in Israel-Palestine, here in the US and elsewhere, and you know, those who are in solidarity with them are committed to reversing the escalation of killings and finding a path of just existence. I would see them in summoning the spirit of Hannah Arendt, one of my favorites as today's conscious pariahs, speaking out against oppression, including oppression within their own community. I see Palestinian human rights and social justice figures who both decry Israel's subjugation and current atrocities while condemning Hamas's actions. I'm an Oda, Palestinian citizen of Israel, outgoing leader of their joint Arab list, uh, was stated, there is nothing in the world, not even the cursed occupation, that justifies the killing of innocent citizens. Today's march in DC, thousands or hundreds, uh, up to a thousand Jews and allies marched to show not all Jews are calling for vengeance, 
calling for a ceasefire. Some of them, some of them had the sign, we refuse to let our grief be used as a weapon. Within Israel, Jewish and Palestinian citizens have joined together in various places, in Haifa and Jaffa and Carmel and Ferretus, to look for missing Israelis. So some Palestinian citizens were looking for them in the Negev while Hamas militias were still present. Others of these joint patrols are looking after the needs of Palestinians and Jews. They're refurbishing shelters. They're helping prevent in intercommunal conflicts within uh, Israel's 67 borders and providing services. More comprehensively, and this is a, a topic of my book, there are Jews and Palestinians engaged in a long-term campaign of deep reckoning for atrocities and injustices, looking for some kind of shared reading of the two big collective traumas of the peoples, uh, the, the Nazi Holocaust for the Jews and the Nakba for the Palestinians, rethinking them together, and a creative new vision for a just coexistence. This has been my project for a number of years. I thank Suzanne for referring that Zionism means a number of things. I focused on what were called the humanist Zionists of the pre-1948 era, ones who insisted that the exciting quest for Jewish renewal and trying to create a new just community in the wake of years of oppression of Jews must not come at the expense of the indigenous Arabs. If it doesn't find a way of just coexistence, it's failed. They lost, but that was their warning, and it's that vision I uh, hoped to revive. I'll close by quoting from a joint statement from Israeli human rights groups, including B'Tselem, Breaking the Silence, the Association for Civil Rights in Israel, Women Waged Peace, and Rabbis for Human Rights. Hamas's horrific crimes against innocent civilians, including children, women, and the elderly, have shaken us all, and we are struggling to recover from the unbearable sights and sounds. Some of us were in the Israeli communities on the Gaza border during the assault. Many of us have family, friends, and colleagues who endured and are still in the midst of the harrowing events. And we all know people who were murdered, injured, or abducted. It will take time to fully understand the implications and consequences of Hamas's heinous attack for which there can be no justification. Most of our teams include Israelis and Palestinians. Therefore, some of us have relatives and colleagues in Gaza currently living under the ongoing assault of the Israeli military. Children, women, and the elderly are being indiscriminately attacked with nowhere to hide. Even now, especially now, we must maintain our moral and humane position and refuse to give in to despair or the urge for vengeance. Keeping our faith in the human spirit and its inherent goodness is more vital than ever. One thing is clear. We will never surrender our belief in humanity even now when doing so is more challenging than ever. Having always opposed the harming of innocent civilians, it remains our duty in these terrible times. As we count our dead on the Israeli side and worry about wounded, missing, and abducted loved ones, and as bombs are being dropped on residential neighborhoods in Gaza, wiping out entire families with no possibility of burying the dead, to raise our voices loud and clear against the harming of all innocent civilians, both in Israel and Gaza. Thank you. I'm going to ask people who would like to ask questions or to make comments to go ahead and, and um, come up and you can line up and we'll kind of take you in turn and, and you can ask your question when it's your turn. Um, and I, we may, given how many people there are and that we really want to make sure that um, everyone has a chance to speak who wants to. I'm going to ask a couple things. One is I'm going to ask for comments to be fairly brief or questions, if you can kind of keep it to uh, 60 to 90 seconds, maybe, for your comment or question. And we'll ask the panelists also not to uh, go on uh, like a very long time in response, but, uh, but to respond thoughtfully. The other thing that I think we'll do is we'll take a couple comments or questions at a time and then turn it to the panel. Sound OK? All right. Um, if you would also introduce yourself as you, as, you, uh, as you begin. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Amos Nadan. I'm a university professor from uh, Tel Aviv University, Israel. Uh, I specialize in Middle Eastern studies, Israel-Palestinian relations. In fact, it's something that I teach here. And I don't know how to comment 
on basically the, the entire panel, but just I was thinking that two sides were really missing here. One of them is discussing about Israel, what's happened in Israel, why Israel reacting in a specific way, and in fact changing in Israel that occurred in the last several years. And the other thing is I didn't hear the word Iran. I didn't hear the word uh, Hezbollah. It is not, as presented here, just a case of Israeli-Palestinian uh, relations. It's much more than that. And there is no wonder that Israel declare war on terrorism the same as the US. And if we speak about numbers, just briefing, um, yes, there is significant problem. And, and Farid and I know each other, and he knows that I support two-state solution. And in fact, I active in two-state solution activities. But it's not the game now. Something significant changed. If you want to count number, so is two numbers. One of them is like if you count the number of people that just murder without counting all the rapes and all the other things that were just murdered on the same day, and you compare it to the number of people, the Israeli people, so it's 12 times more than what was occurring here in 9-11. So no wonder a state understand that it's being attacked by, from Iran by Hamas and the allies and act. It's not a case of Palestinian and Israeli. It's a little bit. The first attack of the Hamas, murdering 500 people, was not of Israelis, was, not, uh, was of the Palestinian Authority, throw, uh, throwing people from the roofs in Gaza Strip after occupying Gaza. So basically, the allies of Israel today are the Palestinian Authority, are the, the, the Fatah. And they have a joint enemy, and more and more people from Fatah says that. Another thing about numbers, the last thing, because you say 60 seconds, and I took more than that. So about number, it's just to remember one specific thing. In order to sort out the conflict between Israel and Palestinian, there is need to compromise and to understand narrative. For Israel, it was not that only 102,000 uh, uh, were killed and there are 5% off. These 1,200 1, people were murdered in the same techniques, the same way that the Nazis killed six million people, six million Jews. So if you want to count, count. This is what happened in the, in the head of Israelis. I really hope, as Farid and I spoke, that later, in a month or two, when things go down, we'll speak peace again and think about solution. But it, I need to understand now that Israel opened war on terrorism, and this is what it is. Thank you. So Ahmed Kuru, Director of Central Western Studies and Political Science Professor. Thank you for all the panelists, very informative. My question can be taken in general, but more specifically to Ted Falk, because you emphasize the dilemmas of both solutions, mentioning that two state solutions have the settlement problems. One state, a democratic state with universal citizenship, also has the problem of population growth and other obstacles, then what is the solution when we look at the future? If there's a good intention, if there is American support in the future for a real solution, what would you recommend? Should I, should I start with that? Um, well, I'm a historian, so I, I look to the past uh, and not the future, and I don't tend to have a, a whole lot of uh, hope for the future. Um, I told a student I was having a midlife crisis, and they say, with climate change, you could be, uh, you know, you could be way past midlife at this point. Um, 
I, I think the closest we get to the two-state solution um, is basically what was uh, agreed at the second Camp David in, in year 2000 or early 2001. And again, that's Arafat gave up a whole lot of credibility by agreeing to limit the number of Palestinian refugees uh, to return to Israel at what some say is 100,000. Um, but I think that plus you know, compensation uh, and third party resettlements is the closest we get to the two state solution. But moving forward, I don't see that as a particularly uh, likely outcome, nor do I think under you know, the, the last 20 years of, of American uh, presidencies or American administrations, uh, I don't think any particular president wants, I don't think America seems like an honest broker to uh, lead to a solution. Uh, and I think we will increasingly see, you know, as we saw in the um, Saudi-Iranian uh, opening of relations that was brokered by China. Uh, so I'm not sure if the U.S. has any real credibility uh, to Palestinians, um, nor do I think does Fatah uh, or many of those secular uh, Palestinian parties. First of all, thank you, Emos. You should have accepted the invitation to be on the panel. Obviously, you have things to say, and we invited you. <laughs> And then you would have been able to say all those things uh, at length and not confined to 90 seconds. Um, about the question of solutions, it is indeed difficult. And I, some, a part of me thinks that it's premature to be thinking all the way to solutions. Can we begin thinking how we take a first step towards de-escalating the horrible situation we're in and thinking about what would be things that can be done that fully humanize every party in this conflict? I think many steps can be taken that would involve, let's say, allowing Palestinians in the West Bank to visit Jerusalem, right, easily. For example, just a thought. Uh, when I was growing up, I used to go to school in Jerusalem. I lived in Ramallah. Last time I visited, which is a very long time ago because I haven't been allowed since then, when I arrived in Ramallah, nobody around me had been in Jeru to Jerusalem for years. They said, we're not allowed anymore. I used to go every day. So create conditions that make, that make life a dignified life for people. That's a first step before we can start thinking about the, the, the solution that's going to solve everything. I would actually also like to um, comment on what uh, Amos said about how the Holocaust is, or the, the recent events, the terrorist attacks have um, reminded Israelis of the Holocaust. Uh, I have heard that sentiment too, and as a, a historian of the Holocaust, I have to say that in my mind this is a preposterous comparison, and I think it is the result of playing up a, Well, of Israeli politics, politicians for decades using and abusing the Holocaust for their own purposes. For example, just one example, going back to 1967, I think it was Abba Eban who said the new borders around the occupied territories are Auschwitz borders. And for me, comparing the victims of the Holocaust to these people who lost their lives, which I regret greatly, uh, that is just, it's not a useful comparison. Um, I, I wanted to address that. Okay. Yeah, you know what? You, you, you can speak, you can, you can have conversation afterwards. I just Thank want to you. say one yeah. quick thing. Uh, again, it's to our visiting Israeli scholar. Um, I guess I'm disappointed that you turned down our invitation. It seems like you, st let me finish, you, you've started, you've, you've talked. Okay. I, I, I'm open to a full discussion. So far, you refused even to deal with me 
and you dismissed me, uh, and even now you don't talk about uh, what I have to say. Uh, nevertheless, I would be really happy to have a discussion. I guess I'm disappointed of just your intolerance. I, I, I hope there's something more to that, but that's how it looks for me, but I continue, I'm open to a discussion. Okay, I think we need to, good. If I can, if I can say one, one thing. All right. I, I, I think an, another issue at here in, in, at stake is historical memory and kind of a monopoly on uh, victimhood. Uh, who gets to be a victim of catastrophe or uh, genocide and whose victimhood is not recognized. Um, I, I, I think a European scholar said that uh, Germany will never forgive the Jews for the Holocaust and I think Israel will never forgive the Palestinians for the Nakba. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. We're gonna try this other microphone and we'll take a couple more comments and questions and then turn back to the panel, thank you. Um, hi, I'm Cyrus Kaley E. Pelikai. I'm a, a close to your mouth. Oh, sorry. I'm Cyrus Kaley E. Pelikai. I'm a grad student here at SDSU. Um, and I'm not really sure how to phrase this because I want to make sure that my question is getting to the point or getting the information from the uh, panel that um, I want. And I think the, what I'm interested in is the, the conditions that help create this situation in the first place. And I think that the issue is very much a regional issue, but it cannot be separated from international factors. And a lot of you touched on this, but like the United States ends up being a great supporter of Israel. And that always struck me as interesting, be or at least the way that this is disproportionately placed because it's a country versus a city. Um, and I guess my question is more, why do you think that um, Israel gets so much more support than um, the Palestinians do um, from the international community, and why do you think that these international players support it? Like, do you think that they are getting some kind of benefit out of it? Do you think they're playing um, on a moral ground? Um, and how does that affect the situation? Very much. Right. Are you able to hear the questions on this microphone? Is that good? Okay, one more, one more comment or question here. Thank you. Um, thank you to all the panelists today for taking some time to talk about this issue. I think it's really important. Um, I have a question, and I'd like to contextualize this by saying that violence against civilians should always be abhorred. So I'm not standing here to advocate for violence, but I am curious. Given that Palestinians have faced a slow death for generations, as spotlighted by Dr. Abdul Noor, and primarily silenced or lied to in political settings, I'm thinking about the continued illegal expansion of settlements on Palestinian land. I wonder what nonviolent options did they have to actually resist? Maybe I, maybe I can start. Um, in response to KLE's question, I think we should distinguish between support, the way that support is given from Western Europe and the United States on the one hand, and you somehow rolled that into the international community, and that's not true, right? All colonized peoples and all peoples who have experienced colonialism, who have had, who have somehow brought themselves to a place where they can empathize with or sympathize with colonized peoples, understand the Palestinian cause. It's people who have never come to terms with their own colonial past. And I think unfortunately in the United States we're only now coming to terms with the colonizing past, right? So it's, it's, it's not surprising where the division falls. It's a different question as to what are the geostrategic reasons for why, it, why the United States is so closely allied to Israel. I think Gr Jonathan might have more to say about that, but the key here is that to remember that the alliance was not cemented until 1967. Only when Israel demonstrated that it was a super regional power did the alliance become really cemented. And I guess that's probably a worry 
for the Israeli military establishment today. Because what did this horrible attack by Hamas demonstrate? In addition to the horrors that Hamas perpetrated, it also demonstrated the Israeli military's incompetent because they were training right under their noses, right? Because how, I mean, it is inconceivable that Hamas should be able to break that barrier. It's inconceivable that Hamas should be able to kill 300 Israeli soldiers in one day. And I think Hamas itself was absolutely staggered by their success. They didn't know they would succeed. And I wonder whether that's what explains what happens afterwards, that the Hamas cadres who finished what they thought they were supposed to do, then went berserk. I don't know. I don't know how much of that is part of the plan, because official statements usually are lies. And the Hamas official statement is, we would never want to kill civilians. We would never violate the rules of law. So that's what they're saying, right? But I think they're also trying to cover something that happened to their own cadres after they had this completely unexpected success. I'm sorry I'm taking too long. Um, to, uh, regarding Jenna's question, this has been the frustration of Palestinians. I recommend to you a book by uh, Wendy Perlman, professor at Northwestern University. She goes through the decades of Palestinian violent and nonviolent resistance, and all the nonviolent methods Palestinians have tried over the decades. You may not know that in the town of Bil'in, for more than a decade, every Friday, people demonstrated against the barrier that Israel built. The boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement in the United States is a non, in the United States and all over globally, is a nonviolent movement. What happens to it in the United States? It gets tainted as anti-Semitic, although even if you go to the sites and you read, you will see there's absolutely nothing anti-Semitic about it. But it's easy to taint any Palestinian solidarity work as anti-Semitic in this country under current set circumstances. That's what happens to Palestinian nonviolent resistance. It's made, it's neutralized before it can ever take off the ground. All right, so a quick comment about U.S.-Israeli relationship without going into any detail. It's sort of a, an ironic fact that when kind of uh, the really close security military relationship between Israel and the U.S. develops, it's certainly not because of lobbies. That's at least very tangential. And it happens under Richard Nixon. 1968, he got 10% of the Jewish vote. I think at one point he said, you know, I, I have absolutely no and he was proud. I, mean, I have no uh, uh, relationship. I, 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 owed, I have no obligation to the Jewish community. And yes, you know, as we know from correspondence and comments, that he uh, was probably our most anti-Semitic president of the 20th century. And yet the relationships increase. And so it shows that uh, you can't really call it the lobby. The lobby may, once it has an opportunity, go with it. Uh, on the Palestinian case, I mean, it's a very a you know, difficult question. I, the way I would put it is, there was a time when the Palestinians had remarkable successes, okay, less so in the United States, but globally, we think about Latin America, Africa, even Europe to a lesser extent. Um, they got the idea of Palestinian self-determination on the map and overwhelming condemnation of the settlements and the occupation. That was a big uh, jump from what was happening uh, as of 1967. And they did. I mean, it's not that the PLO in those points was uh, any a perfect organization, but it was cohesive. It had a plan. Uh, now it's true that there are uh, exciting nonviolence movements like BDS. The problem is the Palestinian dominant political organization, particularly in occupied territories, you're between a rock and a hard place. You're between either the Palestinian Authority or Hamas. So until there's that kind of transformation, I, it's not nonviolent or violent, but they don't have a coherent plan now. Yeah. I, I would, may I quickly? Yes, you um, may. I, I'm just concerned that there are so many other people oh, who yeah, have just, questions. I, I make it yeah. very quick. Um, 
I, I'm less aware than you are, Farid, but I am aware that all the nonviolent uh, means of protest have failed for the Palestinians. But I do feel that this is still, a, this opens uh, the door to say, well, then it was justified. I, I don't think that's what you meant. And I just feel, well, I'm strongly convinced that what you said, that every Palestinian life needs to be, um, it, it matters 100%. The same is true for, for Israeli lives and Jewish lives. And um, attacking in this horrible way that Hamas did, that, that is dehumanizing to the attacker as well. Uh, needless to say, to the victims. So I, 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 don't, I, I just wanted to get that out there. Um, I strongly think I have no solution no, for nonviolent uh, means, unfortunately, but I, I really think we need to very strongly make this, um, make this point that it, it was wrong, it was morally unacceptable, these murders of children. And yes, I, I leave it, I, I stop here. Thank you very much, that's important. All right, um, just uh, in case you're wondering what's happening, we're uh, gonna continue until 8.30. And we have a bunch more people who want to ask questions, so we're going to try to move through them. Um, uh, and I, I thank you for your patience. Go ahead. Hi. Thank you um, for making this space available for us today. Um, Mr. Uh, Dr. Farid, um, you talked about how Palestinian lives um, are regarded, excuse me, that for one Israeli life, I. I when I'm speaking in public, it's really hard for me to talk, but you said, basically, we don't regard Palestinian life in the same way that we regard Israeli life. Um, and it, you talked about, we see them as 5% of a person. And I, that I can't help but draw comparison to the way that we see black people in this country and the way that we, we saw them as three-fifths and the way that we don't know how to handle um, racism in this country and, and um, defend black people, indigenous people, and all brown people. My question to you is, how do you think that white supremacy, not only in the way that the US backs Israel, um, but the way that everybody is backing um, what Israel has done to Palestine um, and left them within a prison without food, without electricity for decades. Let's take a couple more and you guys can decide um, who will respond to what. Um, so hold it fairly close to your mouth. I have a question. And uh, before I ask the question, I want, like, the question I will ask is just to cal clarify and what you guys' opinion on it. And I here for, like, to know more about the situ current to global situation. So um, I don't want to, like, engage in, like, I'll fire the other stuff. So my question is, um, I know that each country or group have moderate and radical. And so in the case of Hamas, it's like the Palestinian radical. And so the reaction of the Israel is a kind of also kind of radical because that is a strong reaction towards Palestinian. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Ori. Um, my, um, before, I just want to state that uh, murdering and killing of any civilian is obviously a horrendous act and is, I want to condemn it to the strongest extent. But my question is, what do you suggest is a appropriate reaction by a government who its civilians are being raped paraded around in cities and streets, their children's beheaded and burned alive, and their families being bombarded into their homes and being held hostage and just being shot at point blank. Uh, 
so I, I, I think in, in terms of that, that last question first, um, I think it's to think about the, the political realities that you know, every, every bomb that gets dropped on Gaza is a recruiting tool for Hamas. Um, and you have to think beyond the, that instinctual desire for revenge. Um, a professor of mine once said, uh, on, on, on the other hand, that uh, rockets vote that every time Hamas fires a rocket, that sends Israeli politics you know, five degrees to the right in that desire for revenge. Um, and I think the opposite is true as, as well, that you know, as conditions worsen in Gaza or the West Bank, the, the more radical elements will be empowered by um, those, those acts of, of, and that desire for revenge. About the question on white supremacy, I don't want to make too much out of this, but I think if you look at the early period when um, the Zionist movement was European and when the Jews who were coming to Palestine were primarily European, I think that played a role in how Britain viewed the Jewish community in Palestine, the Yishuv, versus how it viewed the indigenous Palestinians. Now, of course, after the establishment of the state, especially after 1950 and 51, when many Jews, Arab Jews from Arab countries came to Israel, then the demography changed. But in the early years, when the, Britain were, when the British were in control, I think there was no doubt about it. The Jewish community they were interacting with was a white European community that spoke European languages, understood European culture, was integral to European culture. The Palestinian Arabs were alien to the British. They didn't know how to deal with them. And as a result, I'm sure white supremacy had a lot to do with how the British handled this. All I right, think the other comments stand on their own. Okay, yeah. all right, let's take a couple more questions. Uh, thank you so much for presenting. Um, I really enjoy that. Um, one of my questions that I feel like we didn't really touch on was, and I sort of hear this around in the political space right now, is I always hear the argument of indigeneity and whose land it belongs to originally. Um, my question to you is, does this, in your personal opinion, does this matter? And if so, um, who is indigenous to, land, to the land and what is the rationale behind it? Tough one. <laughs> Uh, my question can be answered by anybody on the panel, but I kind of want to get to the point of why tensions are so high right now. I know that at least on the Palestinian side in Gaza in 2018, there was a peaceful protest where 36,000 people were injured. After that, in 2022, a U.S. Palestinian journalist was killed, in which for three months the IDF denied that it was their doing. Then they came out and said it was us, and then they came out and said the, the officer who killed the person will not be charged. So if there isn't equal law applied and equal humanitarian law, because as I understand it right now, the ICC is not allowed to enter Israel, nor Gaza, nor the West Bank, what is the path forward for peace? I'll pass it to the panel at this point. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> for the third time, I would like <laughs> to say something about the question of indigeneity, a great question. Uh, obviously, when the first Zionists started arriving, uh, Arabs who would later uh, identify themselves as Palestinians were already living there. It was not a land without the people. Uh, it is, however, important to note, I think, that um, Jews throughout the ages had a strong, even if sometimes only emotional, connection to the land. This goes back to ancient Jewish history, and at no time was there no Jewish community. At times it was small, but there was always a Jewish community living in Israel. So um, I, some people describe this conflict as it's really ultimately a conflict over land. Uh, both sides feel that they are justified to hold on to this land. And um, again, uh, it's very difficult to think of a solution 
because with a little bit of an open mind, I think we can see, at least I hope so, that both sides have a, dare I say, right to the land in their own minds, and that's, that's the insolvable problem. I would also, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll also build on that, that idea of ind indigeneity as, you know, most of, most of us non-native peoples uh, in uh, the Americas, uh, no one's really expecting us to go back to our places of origin, but I think it is incumbent on us to do justice to the, the native peoples in the land we inhabit. Just to add to the indigeneity part, I, I would like to resist the idea of competing indigeneities, actually. And you might be surprised by that, since you might think I think of myself as the indigenous Palestinian. I recognize that Jewish people all over the world have a very, very deep connection to this land. That's very important. And Palestinians have at times denied that. There's no point denying that. This is not something anybody can deny. The question is what is, the, what is the effect of that deep connection, right? What does one do with that? How does one accommodate it and respect it? And uh, unfortunately, we haven't found a way of doing that yet. Uh, but I'd rather not have a competition of indigene in indigeneities. Um, as to the question about who will investigate things that take place, like who will investigate crimes? I actually think that's a great question and, and helps me address the question that Professor Kuru asked earlier. What are some, some steps? What are some, some, some things that one can do? Or at least I thought that was a question that you asked. Um, and I think that would be a baby step, right? Instead of saying, let's implement a two-state solution, let's implement a one-state solution of everybody's equal, we can at least start putting pressure to have crimes investigated impartially by credible bodies. That's a step. It's a big step, actually. All right, we'll take a few more questions. Actually, yeah, we have about 12 minutes. I think that we're good. Thank you. I was just wondering if you could explain how um, governance works in Palestine. I tried to look it up online, but I found that um, Hamas has more control in Gaza, apparently, and that in the West Bank, I guess, the PA has like the executive commission on the PLO. And so I'm sort of confused on how they govern or you know, how would you describe the governance and so on. Before I ask my question, I want to reference what they asked uh, about the 40 babies being beheaded. That was a false claim. And the US even came out saying it was a false claim. But everyone ignores the 1,500 real Palestinian babies being murdered. But anyways, um, I wanted to know why I, as a Palestinian, why do I and my fellow Palestinians have to first condemn Hamas before we speak about anything to do. And, but on the other hand, Israelis are never asked if they condemn the violence of the IDF. Let's pause with those two questions, if you would re respond. Uh, yes, Valeria's question, uh, how does uh, governance work uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories? First of all, one should remember it's under occupation, so the sovereignty is limited across the board. Even in Gaza, yeah, there's Palestinian, I mean, Israelis aren't there directly, but given how they control, it is true that Hamas, in so much as it has some control, it, it governs, uh, but it's, it's certainly not a full state by any means. It's more complicated in the West Bank, uh, East Jerusalem. There you got zones. So you have zone A, which in theory is full control by the Palestinian Authority, but it can always be taken away by Israel. So even they have a severe limit on their sovereignty and that's the best of it and that's a relatively small percentage. There's a zone B where there's mixed authority 
So is, Israelis have control over their settlements and ultimately security for the whole region, and Palestinians, the PA, has civil control. So the restrictions get more and more. Zone C, which is, what, over 60 percent, that's uh, completely controlled by Israel. So that's my effort to answer that. I mean, I think the other thing, you're correct. I would still say that uh, I, I don't see what good it does to call it resistance. Uh, I mean, politically, it's just unwise. You're absolutely right. And I think the, the, the ultimate responsibility, I feel as American Jew, but in the United States more broadly, is why aren't we condemning what happens to Palestinians or the universities? Why don't university presidents? Why didn't they say anything condemning the Gaza siege that the ICRC, the International uh, Committee of the Red Cross, has long called collective punishment? So you're correct about that. It, it doesn't, though, lead me to say you should uh, celebrate uh, the type of uh, actions that Hamas did. I, I would also say, you know, as, you know, as Americans, um, we are party to this conflict in a way that we aren't in other places. Um, so, you know, there, there's horrible violence going on in Myanmar. There's not a whole lot America can do about that. Uh, but when there's human rights violations in Egypt, in Israel, Palestine, in Saudi Arabia, those are our allies. And so we do have a, a greater responsibility um, to at, at least attempt to affect uh, change in those places.